Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, my name's Will Huggins. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder at Zucha. Uh, and I'm Hannah McDermott, head of delivery at Zucha. And uh, today we're going to be talking about building collaborative partnerships and handling conflict uh, in digital projects, which um, makes it sound like we're really experts at that, but um, hopefully it's something we all experience. So, um, yeah, just kind of share our experiences with you, and hopefully you will find that helpful. So, um, I mean, the key thing, I suppose, is um, you never start a project with the intention of falling out with the client. Um, everything starts all rosy, everything's really optimistic and you're getting on. And then there's usually a point, sometimes it's gradual, sometimes it's quite sudden, where what you're delivering starts to diverge a little bit from what the expectations of the client are. Um, whether that's kind of in scope, time scale, quality, cost often. Um, then communication become a bit strained and guarded, um, trust starts to break down, and then eventually confidence is lost. Um, and when confidence is lost, it's very difficult to come back from that. Um, you can come back from it, and turning things around is hard, but it isn't impossible. Um, honesty is usually the key that we find. Um, so um, when things really break down, it's usually the situation that no one is completely right and no one is completely wrong. And so being honest doesn't, isn't about culpability or blame. It's just about acknowledging where things could be better or where uh, you could make improvements, but also pointing out where uh, all parties, all members of the team could improve. Um, and being honest with yourself as well. Um, escalation is also important. So bringing in stakeholders... Um, from both sides at a senior level to make pragmatic decisions um, and, and kind of practical steps that can be taken to start to repair the relationship and get things back on track. Um, and, and focusing on tangible outcomes. So sometimes, you know, small steps. So what's going to be the next thing that hopefully helps to build confidence again and, and repair that relationship? Um, but as with all things, um, prevention is better than cure. Um, so... Um, there's usually a few things that you can do along the way that will help to prevent the conflict arising, but also help to address conflict when it does arise. Um, so uh, it starts with winning new business, basically. If you go to the next slide, Hannah. Um, I've certainly been in pitches, um, often with Hannah, where I get the look when I know I've said something that actually probably isn't a complete reflection of what we are able to deliver. Um, and so... It is always starts with that, really. You know, when you start the pitch, you're really focusing on winning the business, not finishing on, com on finishing or completing the project. Um, and so often, some of the things that cause conflict are baked in at that point. Um, so the key thing, I think, again, is honesty. So be honest with the client about what's realistic. Um, it's easy to just kind of nod your head when they start saying things. They want this, this, that, in that time scale for that cost. Um, so it's really important that they understand what's realistic, but also be honest with yourself. You know, other things, the compromises or the, uh, the requests that they're making, something that is going to be worth it for you. Is it kind of the, the quality or the product that you want to be delivering? Um, so you're going into the project right from the start with both sets of eyes are open. Um, and be clear about assumptions and risk. And, and that, I think, for clients can be a real selling point, is point out where you see conflict arising, Where's the risk that things might break down or the, the areas of the project where you think um, there's going to be the key sensitivities? Um, and again, I think clients will respect that but also see it as quite a reassuring and confidence-building element of your approach. Um, and it is about managing expectations. So um, this is one of my favourite images from the internet. Um, but it is about, you know, you can't have everything. You can't have the best product in the fastest time for the lowest money. Um, and, you know, there's lots of permutations about how you manage the interplay between those three things, but ultimately managing expectations and framing each project within its unique boundaries. Um, so, you know, some will have cost pressures but are probably more flexible on time, etc. So really managing the expectations with the client about where the pressures are for them and what you can deliver and what's realistic for the project outcome. 
So after winning a new project, the next step is onboarding. Um, I think from my point of view, I always say that onboarding is basically the foundation um, of a successful project. And, and in this phase, we'd accept, uh, expect to sort of set expectations, uh, form the team, and establish if we've got any known risks. So kind of kicking off on that point, um, the first step is building those new relationships. So from our point of view, we see ourselves as one team with our clients, but that might be easier said than done. Um, to paraphrase the Spice Girls, how do two teams become one? Um, I think this can seem really daunting, but there are some really sort of straightforward and easy ways to approach this um, at the start of a project. Some of the things we suggested here, icebreakers, something as simple as setting up a shared Miro board where the team pinpoint on a map where they want to go on holiday next and talk about it. You know, those kinds of things can help uh, reduce the barriers to forming those important relationships um, that will be important later down the line in the project. Other things like shared communication tools, setting up a Slack um, project that both teams can talk openly on to kind of break down the, the formal communication that might normally happen at the beginning of a project. In-person meetings, I know this can be difficult with COVID and also with remote working, but where it's feasible, I think it's really important to identify opportunities for that. And also looking for any early collaborative opportunities. So are there any technical investigations or workshops that we can have early on to try and um, overcome those kind of initial barriers? After those kinds of activities, the, the key thing would be to establish clear roles and responsibilities. Um, this might seem very simple and very obvious, but it's obvious. It's normally one of the things that can cause tensions in relationships with clients, where one of us um, has made an assumption about a deliverable from from each other, which then uh, comes to blows later down the lines. Um, I think some of the important things to consider when you are mapping out your roles and responsibilities are. Do you know what the roles are that you need in order for your project to be a success? If you don't, then find out and agree it. Are there any key roles um, that are overlapping? So for example, do you have a designer on both sides? In which case, what are the practical realities of that? What, what will each of those designers be doing in the project? And also, are there any roles that you feel have been under uh, resourced or not filled at all? So for example, if a client has said that they want to rewrite all of their content and they have one content editor on their team, that's something that you should be raising as a flag and discussing with them to mitigate rather than it becoming a, a blocker or an issue later down in the project. Um, I think alongside this, make sure that you capture it. I've seen many roles and responsibilities tables in spreadsheets that are hard to read, that no one will ever look at again. Make sure it's easy to read, captured in somewhere that's um, available to both teams, so a shared wiki, perhaps Confluence, that's what we would use, and also make sure it's circulated and signed off so nothing is a surprise later down the line when you say, oh, this is your responsibility. Um, alongside sort of forming the team and establishing those responsibilities, I think it's really important that uh, we have a shared plan. Again, it might seem like an obvious part of kicking off a project, but I think it can be easy to delay this when we feel like we don't have all of the known variables. So what I would say is start with what you do know and create that skeleton and keep it simple. Um, some of the questions that are really important to ask at this stage are, are there any known milestones? Again, seems obvious, but has there been an agreed go live date? Are there any other milestones that the team are working to? Again, are there any unwritten milestones or are there any stakeholder expectations that have been perhaps discussed informally that we should be aware of so they don't trip us up later down the line? Uh, again, are there any internal work streams? So are they dependent on us? Are we dependent on them? Are they going to affect the formation of the team? And also, again, obvious, but client team availability. Are there big chunks of annual leave coming up? Are there any other things that might affect their ability to work effectively on the project? And then finally, at the end of onboarding, I'd suggest making sure you create a risk register. Now, I know everyone will resist the urge to yawn when I talk about risk registers, but I think it's important to remember that they are basically an extension of your initial plan. Um, and it's also an opportunity really early doors to discuss um, issues or concerns from both sides, not just from the client side, but also from our side, um, and make sure that we're having those open and honest communication channels. Um, obviously, the other impact of it is that if we discuss them and agree plans, we can also avoid them derailing the project um, later, later down the line. Um, and as I said here, don't just document them. Make sure you have agreed a plan and dates for reviewing them. So then at the end of onboarding, we've moved into discovery. And this is another really key phase for establishing a, a successful partnership with our clients. 
Um, the first part is really understanding the product vision. If we don't have that shared understanding, how can we possibly kind of work together on the project and we will inevitably diverge at some point? Um, the first thing would be to ask the client, um, you know, what are their goals for the project? What are their expectations? What does good look like? What does success look like for them? Now, they might not always be able to answer that, and I think we could do a whole session on the activities required to answer it, but I think some of the key things to pull out would be stakeholder workshops, user research, and technical workshops to help really crystallize that vision so we both have that shared understanding. Um, I'd also suggest make sure you document what is discussed. It's very easy to have sessions in the early stages of a project and feel like it's just an open communication, lots of ideas flowing, and then two months later, everyone's forgotten exactly what they've talked about. So make sure it's captured in the appropriate way. In order to then deliver the vision, we really need to have a well-defined product backlog. Um, this, again, could be easier said than done, particularly if the client um, has little to no experience of this. Um, we, this is something that we've come across time and time again. So I think it's important here to consider some of the areas where you can support, but also some of the areas that you should leave to the client to make sure that um, we can successfully work on, on that backlog moving forward. So some of the areas I pulled out as do's would be to, you know, use your use your best practice and use your experience to help them whether that's training and how to write user stories whether that's showing them examples from other clients you know use that experience to give them the springboard um, show them where there might be weak areas in their backlog and where you would suggest filling those out or where you know you think oh, okay what about if what's the negative in this situation have you considered these other user roles etc things like that also make sure they sign off um, their backlog um, it can be very easy to assume that things are ready, but don't make assumptions. Make sure that everything has been approved from the, the internal stakeholders or whoever is involved in that process. Um, and also make sure the team um, from your side and their side are appropriately involved. So whether that's your lead developers who are doing your estimates and your, your um, solutions or designers and UX team members that also need to be involved in, in those tickets. On the don't side, I would say make sure you don't take sole responsibility. I think it's very easy, easy to take that role when the client is not able to necessarily create the backlog on their own. But this can lead to problems where later um, in UAT, for example, they receive something for testing and they say, this doesn't look anything like I was expecting, but they weren't involved in writing the acceptance criteria in the first place, so which causes that tension. Um, also, don't try and steam ahead or fill gaps in the backlog. It won't save time. Um, we have done this in the past where we think, oh, let's just move forward and we'll fill those gaps as we go. It doesn't work. It doesn't actually save time. And, and spending more time up front is important. And as I've said there on the last point, don't forget to size or estimate in, in the way that you prefer to do so and make sure you append your technical solutions also. So then once we finish discovery, the next phase is uh, delivery. Um, so I think it's important here to mention that from our experience, we've found that working in an agile um, delivery approach has worked really well for us and for our clients, um, particularly as they're very hands-on through the process. Um, I would say though, make sure that you don't think working agile means that you have to completely overhaul everything that you do and all the things that you do. Um, you know, frameworks are there to support, they're not there to dictate, and ultimately there's a spectrum of how you can apply those frameworks. Um, use what works for you and for your business and for your clients. Don't feel bad if you need to modify or amend those elements to make sure that they are doing what they need to do for your business. As long as you're able to repeat them consistently with success, then that's the key thing to remember. Um, so over the next few slides, I'll talk a little bit about some activities that work for us. Um, some of those are framework specific and some of them are not so much. First one is regular planning. Seems obvious. It's baked into all um, project management methodologies. But I think the key thing here is to flag, don't let them become out of date. It should be regular, but also it should be with the team as a whole. And that means team members from both sides. Um, this is an opportunity for everyone to reset, review those risks that we talked about earlier on in onboarding, uh, make sure we're allocating tasks appropriately and also rechecking their priorities. Are things still as important as they were when we first planned out the initial plan? Identify any dependencies. Um, so are there dependencies within our team, but also with the client team? And look for those you know, potential pitfalls. Are there any deadlines within the sprint that we should be aware of? You know, um, potentially, are there stakeholder demos? Are there other elements that we need to discuss with the client before we kick off? 
The other part we can't um, miss when we talk about ways of working is uh, daily stand-ups, daily scrums, or however you like to refer to them. Um, these are really important to be fully transparent with our clients. We find that they're able to always have a view of how we are progressing, but most importantly, obviously, to manage blockers, um, so flagging them, but also finding solutions for them. Um, one thing I would pull out is make sure to keep them short. It's very easy for these to become unwieldy and therefore lose their effectiveness. So if there are areas that need to be discussed, pick those up in a separate call with the appropriate people to make sure your clients are, are not feeling like they're being dragged onto a 30 minute um, journey that they don't need to be. Um, demos are also really important. Um, I would say we normally discuss with clients at Sprint planning, we use Scrum to discuss whether um, it's needed, but I think it can be a really powerful and simple way of preventing confusion, both in UAT, but also in sign-off. So can we bring in stakeholders early on to visualize what the outcome will be, which can be quite difficult for them during discovery. Um, make sure you agree the agenda um, and allow time for the team to prepare it, but also remember to set the context before you start a demo, it can be quite, um, unusual for stakeholders in particular if they've never been involved in one and they might feel like they don't know where they're coming in. So remember, explain what you're demoing and what it's about and what the purpose of the call is. And then last but not least, the retrospectives. Um, you know, this is the opportunity for the team to come together, discuss what's working, what isn't, and what they need to adjust moving forward. Um, ideally, you want this to be as regular as planning. It's very easy to skip it and think, oh, I don't think there's really much to talk about. Everything seems okay. But if you have them regularly, you'll be surprised at how much might get discussed, whether it's minor or major. Um, it means that we're addressing it on a regular basis rather than letting it fester. Um, I, I would say anticipate the discussion points can be really w wide ranging, whether that's technical, ways of working or other and make sure that both sides feel comfortable to share feedback. I think it's important that it doesn't become a one-way direction, so whether that's from agency to client or normally client to agency, if we're working as a team, it should feel like a collaborative space. Um, and then the final point I would mention is make sure you don't leave your actions in your retro. This is a common pitfall um, for us. We make sure we, at the end of the session, review, prioritize, and then for the ones we agree are the top priority, put them into the sprint so they're there and we can't escape them and pretend that we forgot about them in the next one. Um, so, yes. So, and then I suppose it would be remiss not to talk about the times when it does all just fail and um, all the steps you've tried to put in place um, uh, haven't worked and so you make the decision, often jointly, sometimes not, um, to go separate ways. Um, and so it's important to think about how you handle that ending of a relationship. Sometimes it is better to, to move on. Um, and so one of the things that I'd advise is to, to take all of the same disciplines that Hannah's just talked through into that offboarding, um, as you would do to any, any other project. Um, so approach it really um, systematically um, and try to do a really good job of it, basically. So define what you want to achieve out of the offboarding both for both parties. Um, and then make sure that you deliver that really cleanly. Um, and I think one of the key things that I would say is, is don't burn bridges. So often when a relationship uh, ends because um, the two parties have found it really difficult to work together, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the total end. Um, sometimes the client might think, look, you know, we just need to find a, a partner that we can, work, we can get on better with. And then they go away and find that actually... It was kind of them as well as, as the partner. Um, and so we have seen clients come back. Um, so it's really important actually to approach these things pragmatically um, and, and do it in a, in a way where you really, you're not burning the relationships. You're just accepting that this project or this part of the relationship has come to an end. Um, and so to summarize, um, you know, conflict does arise. You know, web, delivering web projects is not easy. Um, and there's usually multiple pressures on from both sides, so there's lots of opportunities for conflict to arise. Um, resolving those conflicts isn't impossible, um, and it's always worth giving it every possible shot at trying to fix uh, the issues through the things that I mentioned, you know, real honesty with yourself, with the client, building practical steps towards building that confidence back up that you can deliver. Um, but ultimately, focus on each step of the way, making sure that the communication is transparent, 
uh, from right from new business through to onboarding um, into discovery and then through that agile process that Hannah talked about. Um, and then just you know, be honest all the way through right to the, the potential end that if, if you can't resolve things, then find the best way for you and for the client to, to move on. Thank you. <laughs> I think we might have run out of time. Maybe one question. Any questions? Oh. Nothing on it. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the agile delivery. Uh, you mentioned the, the agile delivery, and uh, you mentioned also the stand-ups. Uh, the topic here was the relationship between the us and the customer. Uh, how you integrate the customer in such uh, event of the agile process? Uh, you, it's just you consider them as part of the team, yes. and then they participate like yeah. uh, any uh, member of the development team. Then yes, yeah, so we would, uh, as a minimum, have a product owner from the client side. So they, so they would have. Um, so they would be participating in that way, um, and therefore they're baked into that process by default. They have to really attend those ceremonies, but sometimes there'll be more from the client side also. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, as, as Hannah said, you know, they, they would be a core part of the team. So, you know, just like the developer or the UX designer or the scrum master, the, the client would be expected to attend, not, you know, not the whole client project team, but at least the product owner.